what we're doing. Uh, join me in welcoming uh, Joyce Jang and her presentation, How to Build Teams as an Engineer. Hi, everyone. Good morning, and welcome to PyCon 2018. How's everyone doing? <laughs> Woo! Love it. Love it. Um, first of all, thank you so much for coming and hearing my talk. Um, my name is Joyce, and I'm a software engineer uh, from San Francisco. And um, the majority of my software engineering career has been in startups. Um, I absolutely love startups. They are difficult and challenging and chaotic and oh so wonderful. Um, how many of you work at a startup or have worked at a startup? Ooh, okay, quite a bit. That's awesome. So a lot of you know what I'm kind of talking about. Um, and one of the things that I'm sure you have experienced too is that a lot of times you're thrown into situations where you don't have prior experience and you're just kind of expected to figure it out. So this happened to me not too long ago. Um, I was at a company whose engineering team was split up into three sub-organizations, each led by an engineering director. And um, one of the engineering directors left the company and I was asked to take over his responsibilities and, the team, um, and leave the team. So I knew uh, some of the challenges of the team from uh, a, a kind of service level and from the external side, but I didn't realize how much there was room for improvement until I actually joined the team. And I had never run a team of that size or run that many multiple products or product areas at the same time. And so basically the whole thing was very new to me and I just kind of had to figure it out. Um, so fortunately this story does have a happy ending. And looking back on my experience now, I can see that there were actually some reason to the madness. And what I ended up doing to help set up the team for success is what I'm gonna show you today. Um, and the reason why this, ta this talk is called How to Build Teams as an Engineer is because I wanted to draw attention to the parallels that I realize exist between software engineering and team management. And I hope that each one of you, regardless of your current role, whether it be in management or as an engineer, walks away with an idea of how you can progress the success of your current teams. So this is basically what I did. Um, first step was to gather information and get answers. Second was to set a focus. Third was to draft a team plan. Design fourth is design a communication system. And finally, execute and drive sustainability. Obviously, this wasn't so organized when I first started off, but um, these are essentially the steps that I took. So when I first joined the team, I realized that my top priority was to find some answers. To them, like I had a lot of questions such as, um, what does the team do exactly and what exactly is going on? And so, to get me started, I realized that there were certain categories of questions that I needed answered. So the first category was team identity. This was essentially how the team identifies themselves. So what do they believe are the responsibilities of the team? What's the goal and purpose of the team? What does success look like for the team? What's the team culture? And what are the things that are and are not working for the team? And then th you ask the same questions on the external side. So this is more the idea of team perception. So what does leadership think about um, the responsibilities of the team? What do other teams, engineering and non-engineering teams, what do they believe is success for the team, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, one thing that's really important, especially at startups to identify, is ghost responsibilities. So what are ghost responsibilities? Ghost responsibilities are the kind of things that get done without being explicitly identified. So for example, I think a lot of um, startups with uh, like customer success teams or PMs and designs have a favorite engineer to go to whenever there's like little improvements to be made. And th these are usually um, handled as a result of individual heroics which is commendable, but is not very scalable. So this is one of the things that is important to kind of figure out and um, account for because of the fact that it goes, it flies under the radar a lot of the time. So what I did was um, basically come into the team, observe a lot of the team meetings that they were having, um, see a couple of cycles that they went through in terms of like how many sprint cycles they go through and what their current state of normal process is. Um, and then, uh, of course, I set a bunch of like one-on-ones and individual conversations to just get some information from uh, the team as well as other people outside of the team to get these answers. And essentially, uh, what happened was as I was gathering enough data, you, I started forming my own kind of opinions and deciding for myself these kind of core areas. So what is the goal and purpose that I see for the team? What is working and what is not working? 
And what are the responsibilities and the non-responsibilities of the team? So then from this, you want to create a focus for your team. This can be done in various ways. For example, a team can have a general charter, such as improving the user experience for a specific product flow, or setting a specific value that they want to hit for a key metric. So the goal of the focus is to align the team behind a specific area. And so at the end of the day, everyone on your team should be able to be on the same page about what the goals of the teams are and what the responsibilities and non-responsibilities are. So essentially what you have done is you have locked down on the what, like what is the focus of the team, and now you have to start thinking about the how. So the next plan, uh, the next step is actually to draft a team plan. And so basically that is what sort, thinking about what sort of organization of the people on the team that will allow the team to be successful in achieving these focuses and these goals. Um, so the first part, of course, is the team organization. You have to set responsibilities and goals, and because you have done that and identified that in your, in your previous step, you need to decide how the people on your team will be organized to best achieve these goals. So let's take, for example, this organization that we are all pretty familiar with. Um, this is often the split up of uh, a product team. We have the design, we have the product side, and we have the engineering side. And so we kind of know what each of these components are responsible for and why we have split up the work in this specific way. Another example is this, and this is an example from software. But this is also an example that we are familiar with, and we understand the responsibilities of each of the components and roughly why we have split it up in this way. So one of the things to keep in mind is that these are, the reason why these make sense to us is because they are abstracted in a way that is clear, and we understand the responsibilities of each of the components, and there's not as much overlap in those responsibilities across each of those components. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about modularity and abstraction. These are key core concepts that we know and understand in the engineering world. And as you can see from the two examples before, both apply in the same way for engineering, software engineering, and for team management. Just like how software systems need to be thoughtfully abstracted and modulized, team require, teams require the same kind of consideration. How you organize matters for both software and for teams. We, are all know, we all know kind of what happens when software is not well abstracted or modulized. You end up with very complicated systems that cause a lot of downstream issues and is a nightmare to maintain. And the same can happen for teams. So for our team, what happened was I saw that we were basically responsible for a bunch of different areas kind of um, informally. And a lot of individuals were just kind of in, like working in reactive mode to keep, the, the, keep the everything afloat. And there, were a lot, there was a lot of confusion around who does what and what we're responsible for. And so a lot of the things that would um, come up would kind of fall between the cracks and then eventually be resolved only when it came up as a fire. And so I saw that there were also there are specific areas that needed a little bit more ownership, um, but that wasn't happening because of the fact that there was such little bandwidth across the team. So for example, there was an engineer on the team who was actually the resident expert at one of the products that we had. And he was the resident expert because of the fact that he had been on that project for a really long time, and he was the most familiar with the system. However, he was always put on projects that didn't have anything to do with that specific product. But at the same time, a lot of the, a lot of the support issues that came up and a lot of the product requests that came up would always feel to him. And he obviously had to react to it because he was the go-to expert. Um, but because of the fact that he was balancing this and his main project work, his main project work would kind of uh, slow down in terms of progress. And so this is one of the examples of what I was talking about with ghost responsibilities. These are the things that we want to kind of address. And so the current state of the, pro the, the team that I was looking at was um, that they were just overloaded. There was just so much to do and they were spread too thin across too much. So then I started to look at the current state of everything. From the first step around gathering information, I got a sense of what are the current responsibilities of the team and what's, how's everything working right now. And with the, a lot of the information that I got from the existing team as well as the rest of the organization, I got a sense of like how each one of the responsibilities prioritized against one another. 
So then I basically went in and decided to start grouping these responsibilities and being really ruthless about cutting out the, the lower priority items and setting them explicitly into a non-responsibilities list. So then I made sure that um, the groups of the products areas were well abstracted from one another and fit into the focus that we set in our earlier step. So then it came natural to have an individual responsible for each of those specific areas. And um, I created a lead role and started to write up just the responsibilities and expectations of that role. And last step was to bring the proposal back to the team. And with the team, I went through the, the proposal, got their feedback, and we made adjustments. And then after that, we rolled it out to the rest of the organization. The one key part of rolling it out to the rest of the organization and to the team is to make sure that you hold everyone accountable. One of the biggest pieces that I had to manage was to make sure that I played defense for the team in terms of anything that came up that was on, explicitly on our non-responsibilities list. So things that we maybe would have reacted to in the past but are now going forward no longer going to prioritize for the time being. And also the same goes for the individuals. So a lot of a lot of the team was uh, still in reactive mode. And whenever there was a new bug or things like that to fix, of course they wanted to jump on it and fix it. But I had to be there and call them out and say, we're not going to do it this way because we, here are our list of priorities. Um, oh, I already flipped over to it. Um, so then the next important thing to completing the team plan is to focus on the individuals. So yes, you can have an idea of the roles, such as the team leads that I talked about earlier, and you can have an idea of like, who you want to take over each of those roles. However, this is a little bit different. You kind of want to think about each individual snowflake and how they fit into the plan and the success of the team. So although, I, I want to note just now, although um, we are talking about parallels between software engineering and team management, this is an area where you don't want to apply that as liberally because unlike software, people have feelings, and people are not computers, and you shouldn't treat them as such. Um, and yes, this makes it a little bit complicated, but it's a lot of fun, too. So at this step, you want to basically figure out how each individual falls into um, the success of the team and how they're going to contribute. You want to be able to draft up exactly what each individual is responsible for and not responsible for, how they will contribute to the success of the team, and, how, and towards the goals of the team, and what success looks like exactly for them. And at this point, you kind of need to ask the tough questions too. Sometimes you'll run into situations where there's an individual that doesn't quite fit into the team as well, um, and you kind of need to observe and see if there is a good fit, and if not, you can see if there's a fit in maybe a separate engineering team in the same organization, and if not in the organization, then um, maybe elsewhere. This is a difficult conversation to have. However, you can't think of it as um, a bad situation. It's a win-win. You basically want to help these individuals succeed and do exactly what they're interested in doing. And so by, by thinking about it that way and helping them out, the best you can do is find a place where they fit in the, the current team or just help them find a different opportunity. So great, now that you have your team plan, uh, you'll also, now that you have your team plan, the most important step here is obviously communicating this to the team, um, to gather feedback, um, work with the team, collaborate, and figure out if there's any adjustments that you need to make, and um, make sure that everyone is on the same page about what exactly that they need to do and how they're going to contribute. Okay. So as you're figuring out your team plan and rolling it out and working with your team to kind of get this successful, you'll also start to formulate a more execution plan. So at this step, you'll want to think about what, how the work is going to get done. So make it thorough and look closely at exactly how things are going to work. And because of the fact that this is where the devil's in the details, and the critical part of the plan you want to deep dive into is the communication piece. We all know that communication is important, and oftentimes when a team is struggling, you can, you can pinpoint a place where communication is the root cause of a lot of the issues. Okay, so to get started, here are a couple questions that you can kind of ask yourself. So first of all, how does an individual on the team communicate with the rest of the team? And think about all the different cases where this might come up. So for instance, like how do you communicate progress in terms of a project? How do you decide what, which bugs to fix? Um, and, and those kind of different cases. 
And then the second question is, how does the team, how does the team communicate with people on other teams? For instance, customer issues, product requests, and system dependencies. And then finally, how do we communicate to the larger organization and company? For instance, how, like, again, progress, communicating progress, and planning decisions. Um, so this is basically what you're talking about. There's a team, an engineer, team, an engineer, and there's communication. So this looks very familiar. This is not unlike an API design. So because of the fact that you have your components in place, now you have to think about how they're going to work and how they're going to communicate. And it's not unlike an API design because of the fact that you kind of want to think about the contract. How do you want to communicate? And how does each side understand how they want to communicate to each other? And don't be afraid to be a little rigorous about this, the same way we do about API design, because of the fact that the benefits of doing um, a good job in terms of designing this API is so much more worth it, um, as you also know with API design. So this is an example of what I kind of did. Um, this was the first draft at just like the different components that I was looking at. There's like the design team, there's the PM, there's the leads, there's an engineer, there's customer success, blah, blah, blah. And so all of that, I just kind of started drafting around like different specific scenarios and different channels of communication that is currently happening. And then you kind of start here and evolve it into um, the system that you think could be improved on. Um, so this, the, this step also pulls from a lot of the information that you gathered in your first step. So if you have talked to a lot of people outside of the engineering team and gotten some feedback around like some of these channels that aren't necessarily working out as, as planned, um, this is a good place to kind of incorporate that feedback. So for example, one of the areas that our team was struggling in, in terms of communication, was um, getting the customer feedback back to the engineers. Um, I strongly believe that having the engineers very closely aligned to the customers allows for not only better product decisions, but also just engineering the system that is solving for the right problems. And so I collaborated with um, the PMs of the team and uh, the customer success directors to kind of figure out what is the better form of communication for this channel. So then finally, as you and your team are starting to execute this plan, you want to keep in mind sustainability. At this point, the software analogy is that you have built your first iteration of the system. So obviously, you will continue to iterate. And like your software system, this system will constantly be evolving. And so as long as you focus on gathering feedback and making adjustments as you go, this system will do well. For example, if you uh, realize that there was a ghost responsibility that wasn't accounted for, or if people's preferences changes, or their goals change, or like even the people on the team change, you can just make these adjustments as they come up. However, this happens rather naturally, and so instead of focusing all your energies on maintaining that service, or that, <laughs> maintaining that system at that point, you want to focus on sustainability. So, Basically, what this means is that you want to start thinking about ways that the system that you have set up can sustain itself and ideally manage itself um, and maybe even the upcoming iterations that we talked about so in, in a way that like, you don't have to do this whole process every six months. And you don't want to be the single point of failure here. And it, it, this might not be so great to hear, but you're not the hero in this situation. You don't want to be the hero in this situation. Um, you are also not the star in the situation. <laughs> um, the team is the star, and so you have to get kind of comfortable with being like, in the backstage and starting to think about like, what is best for the team. So if you think about this uh, as a new system, basically we're talking of, what we're talking about is automating it so that it's a little bit more self-sufficient. So how do you do this? How do you automate a team? The funny analogy here is that you can actually automate human behavior through habits. So focus on building the habits of the team early on such that the team is as self-sustaining as possible. This is the time for a lot of change for the team. And so to make sure the change is successful, it's important to manage not only what gets done, but how it gets done. Uh, for example, one of the things that I wanted to improve on for our team was our sprint planning system. Uh, I drafted up what I thought would be a better agenda for the system. And I was starting, like for instance, I wanted to get into the habit of taking meeting notes or sending out the agenda more widely ahead of time and then sending out the meeting notes uh, afterwards. And so uh, one of the things that I 
realized was that because this new process was new for the team, it was kind of like training them to use a muscle that they haven't used before. And so I had to drive the meetings, I had to make sure that we followed this process several times. But over time, this became more ingrained in the team and this became our new normal. And at that point, I started asking each individual to kind of come into play and run the meeting themselves. And quickly, it became a meeting where I no longer was necessary, which is great. Um, and this slide here also kind of gives an, uh, a list of just other suggestions that you can think about in terms of driving a little bit more of the habits into the team. So the main idea to note here is by creating and driving process, you're creating the framework and the foundation. You basically want to think of the, um, the habits as what actually makes the team successful in, in these processes. So next time you're thinking about enf enforcing any sort of process, think about it a little bit differently. For example, are you really trying to count the number of days that people take off for work from home days or for vacation, or are you trying to make sure that the culture of the team is a little bit more engaged and collaborative? So instead of thinking about specific processes, you want to think about driving like, the behaviors and the habits that you want to see in the team. OK, so this might not be a full list or a complete list, but I found that this was kind of like a good anchor point to thinking about a lot of like the difficult problems that come about when it comes to managing your teams. And so if you take this and see if there's um, any sort of other like different analogies that you can draw, like definitely reach out to me and share it with me because I think it's super fascinating. Um, and other than that, I hope everything goes well with your teams. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Joyce. Mm -hmm. And we've got uh, quite a bit of time for questions, if you'd like. Yes. There's one mic at the front here. Uh, if you want to come up and queue behind it, uh, she'll take your questions. Hi there. Thanks for the talk. It was really great. Thank you. Um, did you find generally that people were receptive to the sort of changes you wanted to, uh, to implement? And, and if not, what did you do about that? Yeah, um, so the question was around how receptive the team was to any sort of change. Um, I think any sort of change is a little bit difficult, but the way that I felt was the most productive was by keeping the team and everyone involved in this change even before implementing a new change. So like talking to them about what you're thinking ahead of time and then making them feel like they are involved in the process because they are, like they're, they're the ones that are gonna be executing it anyways. And so keeping them involved as early as possible and having a more collaborative experience in terms of creating this new change has found, has for me worked out a lot better than just coming up with a plan in the dark and like springing it on them last minute. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, so I've been in a pretty decent situation recently where my team has been growing. It, we started off kind of small, got acquired, and then we've been hiring more people as time went on. And so we went from a situation where we had a few members with a lot of responsibilities for a product to a team that's growing and taking in more people and trying to bring them up and trying to divvy up the responsibilities accordingly. And I'm just wondering, can you speak to um, uh, what it's like to have to uh, formulate a team at around different sizes and different head counts and how to uh, adjust that process as your team grows bigger? Yeah, so the question was around um, team sizes and um, adjusting as you scale the team, the, the larger organization, is that correct? OK, great. Um, so this is one of those things where I feel like, especially if the team is growing really quickly, and um, that also implies that there's a lot of change in terms of like the amount of work and what you're working on. Maybe the scope extends, or maybe like the depth of the, the projects that you used to work on have changed as well. And so it's a matter of kind of going back to that list of responsibilities and reassessing and doing a little bit of an audit of like what are the priorities, how do they stack against each other, and how do they actually like collaborate, and so this is kind of where the idea that like abstraction and modularity kind of comes into place too, is that you kind of want to just assess what you are currently working on, and then see where it conceptually makes sense to split it up without being too reactive to all the changes because it's going to be changing so quickly as you're scaling. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the talk. The API thing was a new thought, new thing I hadn't thought of, especially the rigorousness around it. Uh, there's an old saying that engineering is done with numbers, anything else is opinion. Uh, I wondered if you could speak to that. How do you 
evaluate a team with numbers, especially given that products change, that deadlines change, that uh, analysis is done, and what you might what you were working on may not match anymore. So the the saying was that engineering is done with numbers. It's done with numbers. So how do you evaluate a team, the unique snowflake sort of mentality, with something that's more impersonal and easier to have engineering reasoning about? I see. So. You're asking about how um, how the perception of engineering is seen as more of like a. Uh, I mean, when you're making decisions in engineering, you use numbers. We have x many requests per second. We have x many hosts. When you're doing with that team with uh, teams and deadlines and projects, that ends up being softer. The idea of it might take this many engineering hours, but you know, plus or minus 100 mm percent. -hmm. I think. So, oh, sorry, when you're building a team, how do you make those calculations? How do you introduce a numerical analysis as opposed to being uh, having a soft touch. Yeah, um, I think like that. That is still always going to be the nature of engineering, like the the kind of like numbers focus and the analytics and just keeping true to that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's fair. Um, um, when it when I'm thinking about more of like the soft touch, it comes to the collaboration of the team. So like when it comes to individual engineers, like you can set a focus to be like improving the request by. X number of seconds or anything okay. like that. It could be still like true to like the engineering process, but when it comes to like collaboration, um, like you can also set specific metrics around like numbers. Um, but when when it comes to like really making sure that like that process is working like across the team, then you kind of need to approach it in a non engineering sense. manner. Yeah, I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks for the talk. The, uh, on smaller teams, uh, often managers end up writing a lot of code themselves as well, or at least in my smaller team. Uh, so I'm wondering if you have any tips in terms of, uh, you're saying you should take a background approach and sort of support your other engineers, but if they're reviewing your code and you're reviewing their code and you're always having to have your hands in the code as well, are there uh, strategies for sort of maintaining that relationship uh, while still being a peer to them in terms of writing code as well? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the question was around like managing the uh, the expectations of like your coding as a manager versus like your leading as a manager. Yeah, sort of the player coach uh, strategy. How do how do you balance the, those two? Yeah, um, I think one thing that I keep in mind, especially um, when it comes to like just moving projects out really fast, is that I can't be in the line of uh, critical path. Um, I like there will be a lot of times where like like higher priorities will come up in terms of like maybe someone's not performing well or they're not happy anymore or things like that. And so like I want to be a part of contributing to the rest of the engineering team and being involved in like design reviews and like system plans and things like that. Um, but when it comes to like the actual like details of the, the the engineering work, I like to keep it as light as possible just in case like there's anything that comes up that's higher in priority. Hi, Joyce. Thanks for the talk. This was uh, actually really timely. I find myself transitioning from a performer role to a little bit more of a managerial role, and so I have to take a step back. And this uh, this presentation was really timely in order to give me a checklist of like sort of what to do, uh, which is positive. Um, I was wondering if you had any like war stories about uh, examples where you maybe over-engineered your team, or you, or maybe some pitfalls to avoid. Yeah. Oh my goodness. There's so many. <laughs> I feel like. Um, Especially when you make that transition of being an independent contributor to more of a leadership role, you quickly realize that um, you no longer have that tight feedback cycle where, like, as an independent contributor, I don't know, for me, the way I thought about it was that, like, I could manage my own progress. Like, if I built something and then the, the site crashed, I knew that immediately, and so I would have to be able to go back and kind of, like, iterate, like, on that cycle. With team management, it's a lot slower, and sometimes you don't even know if you're messing up until, like, way later, right? And so um, there's just, I think there's so many horror stories <laughs> and war stories, but I think that's the process of kind of learning through all this. And, like, this one, too, I think because of the fact that I, I'm looking back on it now and I'm able to abstract out like the specific kind of key points that I was focusing on, um, it seems like it was a little bit more organized than it actually was. <laughs> it was just pure, like, this is what we need to do. Like, the, the company has a lot of needs and that's, that aren't being met. There was a lot of pressure from leadership. There's all these different things that are happening that is not gonna be beautiful. And you kind of like learn as you go. Um, in terms of specific war stories, um, I have so many. We can <laughs> definitely talk afterwards, and okay. I can share a lot with you. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, yeah, I 
I was particularly interested about communi the communication bits. That's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I wanted to hear your thoughts on uh, the challenges of actually, you know, it's one thing to, to come in and propose communication changes. It's another to actually do the adoption and, the, and um, take on the challenge of having engineers be receptive to the changes. Yeah. So um, if you could speak about some of your experiences of, you know, not just introducing communication changes, but also um, things like changing the tools they use to communicate, mm -hmm. which is often a place where engineers get a little touchy about changing, you know, the tools that they have been using for years. Yeah, totally. Um, uh, I think with that, um, once again, I kind of refer back to like the, w the way I was thinking about it with making sure that people are involved very early on and making sure that they understand like the pain points that are currently happening in the entire system. A lot of times mm -hmm. like there are strong opinions of like people who are like this is the way it works for me and I'm perfectly happy with that. Mm -hmm. But like with a lot of visibility and context around like how it's failing in other parts of the organization and keeping them close to that, I think that is a very kind of imperative thing to hear, especially when it comes to changing. Mm -hmm. And so by giving them the context, giving them visibility around like what's the problem that we're trying to solve together and mm -hmm. like keeping focus on the piece of solving it together, yep. then yep. Um, they're a little bit more receptive to change. When it comes to like just those, <laughs> those stubborn individuals who are like, this yep. is perfect, I don't want it to change. Yep. Sometimes you just have to have the conversation that like, hey, look, like this isn't working for the rest of the team. I understand you really enjoy this tool, but like, let's try this out, right? If mm -hmm. we try it out and like it's, awful and you don't want to do it ever again, then we can like take that feedback and we'll see what we want to do from there. Mm -hmm. But um, sometimes you just have to set, step your foot down and The needs of like, the many outweigh the needs of the few. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Right. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you again so much. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be outside and we can talk a little more about this. Thank you. <laughs>